Amen. We say welcome, grace, and peace to everyone to our, to our uh, Tuesday Fresh Oil Live Talk segment where we are here to strengthen, build, and empower God's people. Uh, we pray that something has been said recently that has been a blessing to you, but we thank you again for taking up your hour's lunch to be with us. I'm with my co-host, Pastor Vicki. We're going to move forward today, guys, so I'm going to ask her to give us a uh, just an opening prayer to take us in and we are going to move on amen That's amen it. lord we just give you glory and honor we thank you lord for allowing us another opportunity to come to fresh oil fire live we pray father that as we continue to study this topic which has been a very very powerful topic church hurt father that you continue to expose the enemy and how he can attack that you continue to allow us to see where we've been hurt and that you continue to allow us to be healed as a result of what we're learning. We pray, Father, that everyone that is watching this video will be blessed and will be able to get over whatever church hurt they may have been exposed to. We pray for our apostle. We pray, Father, that you continue to bless her as well, that she continue to lead this topic, lead us on this topic. And Father, we just say, have your way in this segment today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Vicki. We're going to move forward. Guys, listen, I, I know I'm skipping a beat. For those who might have seen what I placed um, in the feed on last night, we're moving to chapter 14. Good to see your daughter, Mary. I've already spoken to Miss Michelle and others that I cannot see. Listen, we, we talked about what's wrong with these people, you know, the people that have such religious attitudes and mindsets that cause the, the enemy to use them to push people away or to crush people. We started talking about can demons affect Christians. The reason why we're not going to continue in that is because we want you all to read that on your own. We are not here to talk about demonic spirits or anything of that nature, but we do know people that are being used by the enemy. The enemy will use that, that particular influence to cause God's people to be hurt. So yeah. we talked about that. Um, so Pastor Vicki, what do you think about what I just, oh, and then we skipped chapter 13 for a reason. I just need to be perfect. We're gonna, I'm gonna pull that into what we're doing today. The church doesn't seem to care. But for the things that we've talked about, uh, Pastor Vicki, what do you think, Precious? Well, I think last, um, the week before last topic about how the enemy uh, or how people can attack or hurt people, I yeah. think that exposed a lot of things because I know that exposed to me things that I didn't even think about that could have caused church hurt. But what's awesome is it exposed the enemy for who he is and for how he actually gets in, um, gets in the weeds to try to cause the hurt, to try to draw us away from the church, try to draw us away from God, try to draw us away from the word. And as a result, we can't heal because we are so far, we've been pulled so far away. So I think last, uh, week before last topic was very, very powerful. And I agree with you, people just need to go back and read that chapter on their own yes. because it has some more information in there that I think would truly be a blessing to them. Um, and like you said, we can't cover it all on, on our one hour segment that we are, um, that we have, uh, try to have weekly anyway, but we are opening the eyes, hopefully of God's people so that they can see things that they hadn't even thought about. So yes. yeah, go back and read that. But I'm, I'm excited about what we're about to talk about too, because I think that this segment today is really going to bless and help some people be able to get over their church hurt. Yes, yes. Amen. So good to see you, uh, Mother Forbes, daughter Tamika, grace and peace. Congratulations again on your engagement. So listen, guys, today we're going to go to chapter 14. The church doesn't seem to care. And for those who um, have joined us for the first time that we cannot see, we are literally just pulling excerpts from the book Wounded in the Church by Ray Beeson and Chris Haywood, where the subtopic of that is hope beyond the pain. So my hope, my prayer is that once we finish this book, that you have been able to find yourself in a place of healing. Amen. So today we are going to chapter 14. The church doesn't seem to care. And I'm just going to say this as I'm kicking it off. A lot of times people feel like the church does, does, just does not seem to care. Church doesn't care. So people think. 
because of how some people treat them or how leaders treat them or even just those that are in the pews with them but know that we care the church cares but the church is inside of us so don't allow one situation to cause you to feel like nobody in the church cares that may be an individual situation or a mindset talk to me right quick pastor vicky it it really is it really, when you get down to the nitty gritty, it really is a mindset and it really is a perception. Um, and that's something that we have to not to not be too quick to respond to because yeah. a lot of times we will do it with our feelings, uh, but we've got to start putting a little bit more deep thought into those things and then say, well, hold up. Um, that's not really what the word says, or maybe that's not how they meant to say it. Um, so we just got to be, you know, a little bit more patient and a little bit more um, understand that it is a mindset and that we have to, we just got to be a little bit more cautious and patience before we respond. Yes. And good afternoon to you as well. I met her the other day, Amenia. I may not pronounce your name right, but it's a blessing that you're here with us, precious. Amen. So we're going to go on, guys. If Pastor Vic, if you can start uh with us, we are on 184, guys, for those who are with us in your book, Time Moves So Fast. Yes, it does. It always starts off with uh, a quote from somebody, and this guy's name is Francis Anfuso, and I may not be pronouncing it right, but just forgive me. And he says, God may be saddened over what you do, but he's never disappointed in you as his unique creation. God is not disillusioned with you because he had no illusion about you to begin with. Amen. So we're going to start off. The church doesn't seem to care. Go ahead, Precious. All right. A woman reported that she went for a walk with another Christian woman in order to develop a friendship. She recounted, as part of the conversation, I revealed an issue I was struggling with. My friend's response was, well, Jesus just wants to grind you to powder. I was very surprised, but I assume she just didn't understand what I said. So I said it differently. She repeated, Jesus just wants to grind you to powder. We continued our slow walk together. I said I could understand Jesus wanted to mold me into his image, and it may feel like being ground, but he has never treated me like grounding me to a powder, like into oblivion. She repeated, Jesus just want to grind you to powder. I'm sorry if that hurts, but I don't have a filter over my mouth. That's just how God made me. Listen, stop right there. A lot of times some people go to church and that's what they feel because people make them feel like God is only there to beat them up and to bind them up and to chew them up and throw them out. Listen, you need to understand this. I've been in churches where people made me feel like God did not love me because how the way they talked the way they treated people, but that's not God's character. He is not there to, to chew us up and beat us up and all of that. Yes, he will mold us. And in order for him to mold us, he steps back and he allows some things because that's his, that's what he's supposed to do. A good loving father will, will, um, will chasten us. A good loving father will love on us enough to say, Hey, I want things to be a little bit better, but we, we're not in his life. And we don't have him in our life for him to just beat us up. That's not our, that's not the nature, character of our God, our Father. Talk to me, Pastor Vicky. Yeah, when I read this, I was just thinking that we have to be a little bit more sensitive as to how we say things because not everybody can receive it in the same the same way that we dish it out. Because if I had heard that, I probably would have just chuckled and said, Oh, well, that's a different way of looking at things, you know. But we've got to understand that we um we've got to be careful yeah. because when we say things to people who who don't really know us or don't know when we are kind of taking it to extreme yes. it actually could throw them off they might be like eh, i don't want to deal with you anymore i don't want to talk to you anymore and then you lose an opportunity to minister to that person so we just got to be careful and think about who our audience is yeah. before we say anything. And then we've got to, to filter how we're going to say it so that they will be able to receive what we, you know, 
what the words that we want to share with them to bless them because most of the time we certainly aren't trying to knock them down or bring them down but the way you say it the way you deliver it it could be perceived that you are trying to knock them down or bringing them down or give them a uh, give them a parable that ain't even in the bible <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so that they would have to go back and try to interpret it on their own. Yeah. So it's, it's better if we, and this is how I say it, it's better if we make it ABC style so that anybody who is listening can understand what you're saying and you got it in the simplest format. And no matter where they are in Christ and they might not be saved at all, they will be able to understand exactly what you're trying to, you know, relay to them, you know, with what you're saying. Yes, I want to say one thing that Holy Spirit just brought to my remembrance after watch how I say it. There was a young lady in my church years ago, and we had an altar call, and I told everyone just to pray over everybody. But this another individual decided to speak into that person's life, and they the way they said it was, you're going to die. That's what the young lady took, and she thought God was saying, I'm getting ready to kill you, I'm getting ready to destroy you. So she never came back to church, and when I finally talked to her, I said, wait a minute, I don't think that's what she was saying. So when I talked to the other person, because see, that's when people feel like the church doesn't seem to care. She felt like I didn't care because I allowed that person to speak into her life. But the individual said, the Lord said he wants to mold you and build you, but your flesh has to die. She didn't hear anything, but all she heard was you have to die. You know, and so people will think the church doesn't care because they feel like this is how God is making them feel. So you have to be careful when you even when you receive a word, don't take that word at face value. Talk to your pastor. Don't run and hide and feel like when well, nobody in that church cares about me. I just needed to say that because people have a tendency to think everybody in the church is the same way and nobody cares because they are allowing this to happen. And that's not always the case. Go ahead, Precious and Reed. I needed to just share that. All right. We don't have the luxury of deciding that we can say things any which way we like. Mm -hmm. We are not just responsible for the words that leave our lips, but also for how we say these words. Another woman reported, I once heard a mega church pastor say he was condemning a section of Christians, brothers and sisters from the pulpit, that it doesn't matter how I say the truth, the fact that I say the truth is all in, I'm sorry, the fact that I say the truth at all is love. Mm -hmm. This is so far from the heart of God. God wants us to know the truth, but he also wants us to hear it in a way that we are able to respond to it and to him. We agree. Yes. The disciples were famous for saying things that were inappropriate. And this is reference, they are referencing Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 23, and it reads, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then it referenced Mark chapter 10, verse 47. The blind man in the street pleaded, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the disciples wanted him to shut up and stop interfering with spiritual work. Mm -hmm. Then there were the children who wanted to be close to Jesus. But the disciples tried to chase them away. And then there was the and then when Jesus paid attention to a woman of bad reputation, the disciples, um, I'm sorry, the disciples questioned why he would do such a thing. These were um, I think that's a typo in the book. These were the disciples before the advent of the Holy Spirit. Hey, stop right there. Did y'all catch what she did? She was reading all of these incidents where the disciples decided get away the disciples decided good to see you daughter deborah the disciples decided they didn't want that they shouldn't be near jesus the disciples decided and that's the thing there are some people in the church that have already made a decision that this is how you have to do this is how you have to say don't get close to jesus don't say anything to jesus don't say anything to this person or that person because i've had people to say to me certain people in the church have said certain things and, and told them they cannot get near me well, first of all, as a pastor, I don't belong to anyone but God. 
And if I choose to open my arms as Jesus did to the littlest of the smallest of ones, then no one has the right to shun them away. Because that's why the church feel that people feel that the church doesn't care because it seems like the pastor or the leaders are allowing these people to push them, to, to bother them, to trouble them, to dishearten them. So I say to leaders, you need to be careful, first of all, who you have to help lead, but then you also have to be careful with your, with your people. Make sure your people aren't pushing people away because sometimes we as pastors, we start saying, why is it thinning out? Because someone in the church has said something or did something and it made them feel like nobody cared. That's mm -hmm. not of God. Talk to me, Pastor Vicki. You know, when I was reading this, I was thinking about how we often put our feet in our mouths by saying something that we shouldn't say. And it's obvious in the um, in the um, in this in the in the Bible that the disciples did this quite often, mm -hmm. but they didn't understand or completely understand Jesus's heart yeah. or the heart of God. And so when we are speaking and especially if we're speaking on behalf of somebody else, we gotta know their heart. We, well, we gotta know the word and then we gotta know their heart. And then we've got to respond in a loving way that's yes. not gonna push them away, yes. but maybe you know draw them closer to God and also say it in a way that will kind of make them think, you know, um, about what they just said or what they just asked. And then you, if they say something and you can go back with a scripture, well, doesn't the Bible say yada, 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 and yada, and wherever? And then they may say, oh, I've never read that, or I never heard that, or I didn't think about that. And then you've got, now you've ch helped them change their mindset. And then, you know, before they come back with another question, they may even take the initiative to go and research it themselves yes. before they come to you. And then after they've researched it, they may not have to come to you because now they may have a better understanding or they may come back to you and say, well, I read this, but I don't completely understand. Can you help me? Um, can you go through this with so I can understand? So it's a process of helping them change their mindset just by um, educating them on what the word of God actually yes. um, tells us. Yeah, so it doesn't mean that people don't care. Sometimes they're just ignorant mm -hmm. to the word themselves, you know, but so let's not judge people either. But as she mm -hmm. said, do your part so that you can help you. Go ahead, Pastor Vicki, with the next part. We today still say things that we haven't thought through or that are incorrect assumptions. Even worse, all of us are more likely to repeat what we've heard from someone else than to puzzle out what we actually think. In some cases, we may call them cliches, but whatever they are, they can be devastating. Many of them may be true or at least have a degree of truth in them, but when given in a matter of fact way, they take on negative meaning and damage spiritual life. Mm -hmm. We are including three lists of cliches and hasty assumptions, and our intention is twofold. One, we hope that by reading these cliches and thoughts, you will gain a greater understanding of how easily words can wound regardless of the good intentions. And two, we hope that if you have believed any of the following, you will find freedom from them. <laughs> so we're going to talk about brutal cliches, first of all. Yes. Um, so the first cliche is, if you were really serving God, you wouldn't be in such a mess. Oh, stop right there just for a minute. Have you all ever heard people say that? Mm -hmm. If you're really serving God, your life shouldn't be in shambles. If you really believed in God, you should have this and you shouldn't be doing that if you really believed in God. And a lot of times people will say that. But someone said to me, if, if you were truly serving God right, you wouldn't keep had you wouldn't have that issue that had allowed you to have surgery. And I'm looking at them like, really? <laughs> but we have to be, see, I'm a strong woman in God, so it doesn't bother me. But the average person, the average Christian in a church, if they hear, if you were really serving God, you wouldn't do this, this, or this, or your life wouldn't be in shambles, that individual may say, you know what? Well, maybe I just go back to the street. Mm -hmm. Evidently, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. It doesn't matter that I'm trying. And that's how people make folks feel sometimes. What do you think, Pastor Vicki? 
Yeah, and then it also might make them feel like, okay, well, what am I doing wrong? And I'm doing yeah. everything wrong. Um, and they start getting panicky and they say, okay, well, I need to know what it is I need to do. But yeah. the sad thing about it is they, uh, they, they trust that when this person spoke back to them that they would speak the truth yes and that they will be able to resolve help them resolve uh yes. whatever issue that it is that they're dealing with and they don't you know they don't anticipate that you're going to come back and say right well if you were serving god you wouldn't be going through this because we all go through so we know that that was not a true statement but then you have the people that really think that they're perfect that they are above everybody else and they think that at least they try to make you think that they're not going through, but we're all going through. So yeah. now I know I have said even recently that come on now, you've been around me long enough as Jesus told the disciples, have I not been around you so long that you don't understand? Now I've been around people and I said, wait a minute, you've been around me this long. Your faith should be a little bit stronger. That's not a put down. That's challenging that person to understand, hey, you need to do something to build your faith. Because if you've been around Apostle uh, Gail, we try not to use our last names too much. I'm going to have to change some things. Uh, if you've been around me too long, then guess what? Your face should be should have been challenged in a sense that you should be like, wait a minute. I shouldn't be thinking this way. I shouldn't be feeling this way. Y'all you, you understand what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. yes, I've said that, but it was in such a, a positive way. And I will continue to say that. Come on, baby. Now, you, you've been in that long enough now you've been being in that bible study you've done this long enough that come on you need to come up you need to rise up that's different mm -hmm. so that's not a put down it's a build up mm -hmm. so oh, you want to comment on that or you want to go on and read well that's just letting them know that you see the potential and i and, care and you care exactly so that's what yes. i that's what i get from it anyway when i'm i want to hear you say that yes all Good right you, um Debbie. Go ahead. So uh, it they reference two scriptures. The first one can uh, comes from Romans chapter fourteen verse ten. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contentment for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And the second one that it referenced is Job chapter twelve verse five, and they reference that this is coming from the NIV version. Those who are at ease have contempt for misfortune. <laughs> Okay, so they go on to say, just because a person is able to avoid trials doesn't mean they're righteous. Remember the lies of Joseph, Daniel, and Paul. How do you explain why Joseph had to be thrown into a pit by his brothers and left for dead? Or why do we ha or had to endure prison falsely accused if he was such a spiritual man? Or Daniel, why did he have to endure the lion's den if he was such a mature man of God? Or why did Paul have to suffer shipwreck and undergo um, beating, scourgings, and mistreatment in prison, if he was such a uh, if he was such a man of faith, surely a life of ease does not equal right standing with God, and a life of hardship does not equal God's displeasure. Okay, all I want to say to that is we have all gone through our situations, and uh, so don't allow anyone to make you feel like you are out of the will of God or you are not good enough you know, and make you feel like nobody care because you're going through these things. And so I say to you, if you around people that are constantly saying to you, if you're really serving God, if you really saved or whatever, you wouldn't be in such a mess. Those are the type of people you need to really remove yourself from. Amen. Okay? Because people in the church do care, but that type of attitude make you think nobody cares. So I would say again, remove yourself from those people. If they're not building you up, if they're not saying things in love that shows you that they care enough about your well-being and your walk with Christ, you need to walk away. You want to comment on that, Pastor Vicky, or, or move or move forward? Good well, the only thing the only thing I can comment on is to say that you know we've all been in messes. We and we're gonna go in probably into some more. But when you talk to somebody about it, if they don't say, I'm here, I'm listening, yes. um, share your story with me, I'll be praying for you. Um, I'll pray that, you know, God will help you get through it. If they don't have encouraging words to say to start off with, yes. then I wouldn't continue the conversation. Yes, yes. Because we've all as leaders rebuked people, but we've some of us rebuke in love because we do care. Go ahead. Amen. Okay, the second cliche. I'm sorry. Good to see those who have just joined in with us. We are on 
page 186 in Wounded in the Church book for those who are joining in for the first time. Go ahead. Okay, so we're on the cl second cliche on page 186. Um, you have problems because you need to learn your lessons. God is trying oh. to teach you something. Mm. <laughs> oh, I just gotta make one comment. I've heard people say that so many times to people, you have problems because you haven't learned your lesson. Come on now. Sometimes God will allow the trials to come our way. Sometimes he will allow situations. And yes, there are certain things that we should learn. I tell people, don't just go through it, but go through it. We should learn from what we go through. But when people constantly say you're having problems because of this, you try having problems because you haven't learned anything, then there's a problem with that. You know, now if they say it in love and say, baby, you know, maybe you're going through that because you're, you you got to strengthen your faith. Maybe you're going through that because you need to look at where you are, what you're doing or how you're doing it. That's a different way of putting it. Amen. But you do have some that throw themselves at people and make these say these quote unquote cliches and they, they just begin to think everybody feels the same way about them. Amen. You know, someone said to me one day. I just didn't want to say anything to you because I didn't want you to feel as though I'm going through the same thing again. Well, honey, you need to learn me because I would never think that way. I would help you and try to help you get built up on your faith and help you to see what you need to do. Go ahead, Pastor Vicki. All right. They reference Philippians chapter two, verses one through four, and it reads, therefore, is there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And they also reference 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 11 and verses 14 and 15. And that reads, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Now we exhort you brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint and hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but also pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. That one part of that scripture, be patient with all. God, we have to be patient even with those who don't seem to be learning. We have to be, be patient with those who seem to always, you know, go through. And we have to just be patient with people in their struggles because someone has been patient with us. So some people do care and some of us want to be patient with you now sometimes i'm not gonna now pastor vic i'm pastor vic i'm gonna say sometimes my patience is being tried because i'm going wait a minute have i not been around you this long come on why are you still you know but it's not in a negative you know but yet i still have to have patience what do you think before you read and then we're going to read that comment uh absolutely and you know patience is key especially for leaders and pastors because if you don't have that patience then you have a tendency to possibly say something wrong that can cause the church hurt but we got to understand that everybody doesn't doesn't learn and grow at the same you know the same yes. level and that we've got to be patient with those that that are on you know on that that what you what you've been preaching about on that surface level we've yeah. got to be patient with those because we know but i you know i'm kind of glad that they're coming back to you or to the pastor because it's obvious that they don't have a, a good understanding yes. but if they keep coming back if we keep talking to them if we keep encouraging them then they're in understanding grow and then they start to grow and then they can come off of that surface level level but if if they're on that surface level and we don't have the patience that a leader should have then we have a tendency to put down, let down, yeah. or crush their spirit, and then they will never get off the surface level. So that patience that you that you mentioned, that is key when it comes to dealing with people. Yes, yeah, but if they've been on that surface level for 10 years, then something's wrong. It's something wrong with their walk. And we have to be stern enough to say, come on, let's see what we can do to pick you up and build you up. You know, because sometimes people, sometimes people wanna hold your skirt tail or the pant leg they don't want to grow that's a difference but that doesn't mean we don't care because we're saying wait a minute 
have you not grown any? Okay, so read the, the since you've been reading, I'll read the, the comment. Okay, uh, Miss Bat Miss Bass wrote, everyone is on different levels in God, but we all go through and should should put God in everything and learn and grow. Uh, you have to do your part. Not everyone is out to hurt. Amen. Not everyone is out to hurt you, but to build you up. That that is so true, daughter. So true. Amen. Okay, go ahead. All right. It is important to examine the motives behind the things that we do. Are we trying to encourage or do we hope to just prove a point to make ourselves look good? Mm. What we say and how we say it is, vi is of vital importance. It means the difference between placing more burdens on someone and taking burdens off of someone. People who are going through various trials need consolidation, um, consolation, comfort, affection, and mercy. The Bible describes good as a good father. I'm sorry. The Bible describes God as a good father, one who knows how to give good gifts to his children. See Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If we truly believe this, then why do some of us attribute trials and pain in our lives to God trying to teach us something we are reluctant to learn? We would never wish sickness on our children or break their legs because we want to teach them something. Amen. I want to comment on one part that you said. You said, are we trying to encourage or do we hope uh, to just prove a point to make ourselves look good? We talked about this back maybe in three or four chapters back where you have some leaders who feel as though my point is the only way I'm the pastor you got to lift listen to what I say don't question me don't challenge me you know we have to get to a place that we don't have to prove a point to anyone we just want to show them where it is in the word how they should be growing how they should be picked up but at the same time also show them in the word that God cares about them he's a good father we talked about in our school of ministry I think a couple of a couple of classes back where where we talked about what type of God father do you think God is is, is he a good father is he a giving father is he a loving father or, or is he a, a bearing father you know it's different types of, of, of scenarios so we have to get to a place to understand God loves us so much and he cares so much about us that we need to show people the same kind of love we need to be the same type of person that God was was he, he's such a loving father that even when trials and things come our way he shows us how to grow through them and come out of them but we don't have to prove ourselves to anyone and there are leaders who try to prove themselves because we're talking about church hurt there are people who try to prove themselves in church. It's going to be my way or no way. It's going to be my point or whatever. And that's not showing that they care about anyone but their own reputation. Talk to me. Yeah, you, you, we do have quite a few leaders that have that is my way or the highway attitude. And if I said it, then believe it because that's the way it is or that's, that's the way um, God intended it to be. Um, but, but unfortunately, those leaders are the ones that end up hurting the most because all it takes is, once again, patience to actually hear what the individual has to say. Yes. Let them voice their opinion because sometimes they just got it. You know, the person just want to be heard. And then once you hear them, then you might say, OK, well, I never thought about it that way or no, we can't do it that way because the word says this or because of that. But you've heard, but you've given that person an opportunity to voice their opinion, and now you're gonna move on. Because if it's the my way or the highway, one or two things is gonna happen. That person is gonna continue to bring it back up. Yes. If you haven't expressed, you know why it is the way it, you said it was, or you're gonna cause that church hurt, and you're gonna cause them to draw back and and possibly leave, or possibly say, well. This is how all leaders are in the church. I don't want to have any parts to do, part to do with it. So that patience is key to actually listening, to let them voice their opinion, let it, them get it off of their chest. And then a little simple explanation might be all that they need to understand why you said that it is this way. Or a scripture to back it up might be all that they need. Yes. To understand that this is the way God had intended for us to do it the way that you said it needs to be done. Yes. I just want to say one thing. Church hurt doesn't just always come from the leader. 
it comes from the other members within. I needed to say that as well. So we have to always look at both sides, you know, because I just sent someone saying she's always tearing down the leader. No, because that pain can come from anyone. Amen. We have to show the people that we do care. Okay, go ahead with cliche number three. All right. If you want something too much, God won't give it to you. You have no right to ask for things for yourself. Ooh, stop right there. Because for some, <laughs> like, some of you may have just come on and we're talking about different cliches that people will use in the church to hover over folks, to make them feel bad about themselves. Okay? If you want something too much, no, God won't give it to you. He said, ask and it shall be given, but you need to make sure it's in his will. But for those who try to tear you down and says you don't have the right to ask, that's not even godly because his word says again, ask and it shall be given Amen. Come to me. So the thing is so many, so many quote unquote spirits in the church, religious demons, as we talked about at the BCAP or two weeks ago, will come up with crazy stuff like this. And we have to be so careful. You don't have the right to ask for things for yourself. The devil is a liar. And they make people feel like God just doesn't even care. Nevertheless, if the person care, but God doesn't care, but he does care. You want to comment on that or you want to read? <laughs> nope, I'm going to keep on reading. They reference scripture, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Hmm. Because a loving father always wants to give good things to his children, we are allowed to desire good things from God, and he desires to give them to us. Do not be deceived by beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And that came from James chapter one, verses 16 through 17. Not only is the cliche false, the Bible tells us to expect the exact opposite. Yeah. And as if we needed any more proof, Hebrew 4 chapter 10, um, I'm sorry, Hebrew 4 chapter 16 tells us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yes, yeah, so make sure, good to see your daughter Helen and Louis Braswell, okay, from my hometown listen so don't allow people to make you feel like god doesn't care don't go to him don't ask him for anything because he's not listening the devil is a liar he has already said in his word again all we have to do is ask so we know that's something that some religious demon has thrown out there i know i keep saying that a lot today don't i hmm. okay read on <laughs> <laughs> okay this is cliche number four if you ask for one thing God will probably give you another to keep you from being selfish. Mm. Yeah, have y'all ever heard that before? No, I hadn't heard that. I've one. heard that before. Someone said to me, well, if you ask God for this, he may not give it to you that way. He don't want you to get selfish. He don't want you to get prideful. And I just looked at the person. I said, you're trying to tell me if I'm asking for healing or I'm asking for a place to lay my head, God will give it to me because I'll be selfish. Now, some people will be selfish sometimes with God when God gives them things, but the average person won't. So for someone to say this, that's really sad. Okay, go ahead, Pastor Vicki. This um, scripture that they reference is Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Mm -hmm. The perception and lie behind this cliche is that God is not kind, loving, or deeply interested in our personal, physical lives here on earth. Mm. And furthermore, that wanting anything beyond our needs is corrupt. Lack of understanding of God's character often goes back to our own personal experiences with our earthly father. This is true of the preacher as well as a congregate, um, as well as a congregation. If a preacher has a twisted concept of the father, it will negatively affect the lives of others. It can stem from a spirit of discontent as well. Christians who are bitter at their lot in life hold it against God and begin to believe that he is tight fisted and mean rather than wise and gracious. Yes, and I'm glad it said preachers and others because so many people, if they had a bad childhood, 
and they feel like their natural father doesn't care or their natural mother that didn't care, then they push that on other people to make people think God doesn't care. And that's just not so. So if you're around people like that, again, I'm saying you don't have to walk away, but pray for them. Amen. Pray for them because God is kind. He is loving. He is a good father. You know, but if you're under leaders that aren't kind and they're not loving and they're not good leaders, then it's time to walk. I know I keep saying that and I don't know why, but maybe someone is listening and need to hear that. Understand? But we're talking about the church doesn't seem to care. Some of us in the church do care. You want to comment or go to cliche number five? Well, when I was reading this, I was just thinking about contentment. Mm. Um, we got to be content with what, yes. what we have because a lot of times all we're thinking about is what we're lacking. We're not looking at what we That's have. Right what we've been blessed with we're looking at what we've lacked yes. and in this situation it looks like maybe the the person might have been asking for something and the pastor wasn't content that he didn't have it and so he you know he you know jumped on this little cliche which we <laughs> we know is not true but i know people i've heard people or seen or know people like this because they don't have it. They don't want you to be blessed with it, but maybe they don't have it because they didn't ask for it. Amen. And you did. So, you know, it's just something to think about, but I'm glad they brought this cliche out because it certainly is not true. Amen. Okay. All right, we're gonna go on to number five. Mm -hmm. uh, number five says, if I am right, it doesn't matter how I say it. I'm just God's messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Ooh, I could wait on you to get there. If you keep hearing stuff like that, you might want to be careful. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Now, as a prophet, if the Holy Spirit gives me something for you, he words in my mouth, he sees in my tone, so that even if I come and he's cutting, it's such a way, like my mother said, she got cut and she didn't know she got cut for two whole weeks from something that I said to her. So there's a way that you can share it in, in a loving way. But people always say, well, if I'm right, it doesn't matter how I say it. I'm a messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. I've heard that too many times. The devil is a liar. Anytime God gives a word to a true prophet, he, they're gonna give it in such a way that it's still loving and it's still caring, even if it's, even if it's a rebuke. So be careful how you hear people say, I'm the messenger from God. And if everything out of their mouth is harsh and bitter and controlling, they're not God's messenger. That's flesh in the work. Talk to me, Pastor. Amen. This is certainly brutal yeah. because if you come across um, like this when you are talking to somebody, then God's going to judge you. You ain't got to worry, worry about the person judging you. Yeah. God is going to judge you because you haven't done it in a loving, uh, loving and caring matter. Right. And it certainly doesn't come across to the person who's receiving it as you love them. Yeah. So, you know, and, and this is just true in general, not just on a biblical sense. Yeah. This is just true in general for any and all things that we say, regardless of whether we're right or wrong, we got to come correct and we got to do it in a loving manner. Yes, because I'm quick to say, Lord, word in my mouth, word in my mouth, word, oh, word in my hands. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit is the one doing the talking and writing and not me. Go ahead Amen. and try to get one more cliche. Oh, go ahead. You got to finish that cliche. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the scripture they reference is Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, and this is the NCV version. The Lord God gave me the ability to teach th so that I know what to say to make the weak strong. Every morning he wakes me. He teaches me to listen like a student. And also they reference Ephesians chapter four, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things to him who is the, to him who is the head, Christ. Heartless and thoughtless people turn others away from wanting to pursue truth in Jesus. Their obvious blatant disrespect for anyone who doesn't agree with them pollutes the conversation and makes a way for contention. Yes, I want to say, I remember someone said to me recently, every time they go to church, their pastor is constantly beating them down from the pulpit, constantly saying, this is what God gave me for you today, and you're going to just hear it. You're going to sit through this, or or they the way they were talking was that they felt as though this person was constantly trying to beat them up from the pulpit and blame it on God. That's a person that does not care because that's not God's way. So God has given me some real heavy sermons before, 
but he gives it in such love and I give it as in such love that it hurts, but yet it's a healing within that. So we got to be so careful, especially for those leaders that may be listening, that love to try to tear people down from the pulpit and then it makes everybody feel like God doesn't care about them. Okay, let's try to get this one, this one last cliche in and then we're going to quit. Okay, cliche number six, you're too damaged to serve the Lord. Mm. You want me to keep reading? I just want to say this. Someone said that to me before years ago when they heard my story and read my first book, how are you going to serve God? You're going to look at everybody and say, all men are this that raped you. You're going to look and say, all of these people did this and that to you. Now you're going to take that out on the church. Listen, we are not damaged goods to God. Well, all that I went through has been a blessing because now I'm able to minister, not out of my pain and hurt, but out of a desire for others to get healed from their pain and hurt. So we have to be so, so careful. You are never, never too damaged for God. I love there's a movie, there's a movie out that was called Damaged Goods. Mm -hmm. All these people had gone through, whether it was rape, whether it was this, whether it was drugs, whether they were left on somebody's doorstep. So we got to be careful. We need to let people know God has something inside of you for us. Amen. One has a gift in them. There's something in you that needs to be shared. So never feel that you are damaged and God can't use you because he doesn't care. You want to comment or you want to read? Because I'm just gonna all I'm going to add to it is that's part of your ministry. Yes. Because you'll be able to bless and help somebody else get through yes. what you've already experienced. Yes, that's your testimony. So that's not damaged goods. The Bible talks about we are to give our testimony. That's where it starts. Okay, let's, let's see if we can read this. All right, the scripture it references 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. They also reference 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 9 through 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am for when I am weak, then I am strong. And it goes on to read, it seems that if we are to hear God correctly, a key qualification for service is our very weakness. It doesn't mean that we make our own selves weak in order to be used by God. It means that God can strengthen us outside of ourselves to further his kingdom. Many who minister will say when they use, I'm sorry, many ministers will say when used in powerful ways, that wasn't me. They can tell when something happens in them beyond their personal abilities. Yes. I just want to say, um, for those who may be dealing with this particular cliche, I felt like because of all that I had gone through, God could not use me. But then when you have people looking at you and they're making you feel that way as well. So when God started using me, I felt like I wasn't worthy. But because he cares so much about me, he said, but you are because I have called you and I've set you in this place. So I am a living witness to say, listen, don't let nobody tell you you're too damaged, you're too messed up, you're too weak, you're too this or that to serve God. The devil is a liar. He cares so much for us and he will use the weakest thing. As I, the, the scripture that she says, he will use the foolish thing to confound the wise. He used the foolish things that people looked at in me to cause people to see that God does care about us. You got any comments on this particular cliche? Pastor Vicky. No, but um, I think, well, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I, I personally feel that when I say that I am weak and that I want to draw back and allow God to do it, but yes. do it through me, yes. then that's when I am my strongest because now he, the Holy Spirit has come forth and things start to happen. But when I go in, if I go in with an attitude, I know what I'm doing, I know how to do this, I can get this done. 
and I feel like I'm the strongest one to get it done, it is not a good outcome. But when I admit that I need the Holy Spirit to yeah. take over and that I want to just shut myself down so that he can come forth, then that's when the revelation comes forth that, okay, Holy Spirit has showed up. He is mighty. He is powerful and he is strong and he is using me as an instrument to get his work done. There is a total difference. But when we go in there thinking that, you know, we're damaged goods and we can't do 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 um do God's will, that is when he will show up when you call him and ask him to show up. That is when he will show up and when you actually start feeling stronger because he has taken over. But now when you go in weak and you don't call upon him to assist, then you're going to remain weak. But all you got to do is call upon his name yeah. and things will change. That weakness will dissipate because he shows up right. and he gives that strength that you need to be able to get through whatever it is that you're dealing with. That's it. it is 1255. I, Holy Spirit just brought something to my attention. So I just want to say this. Someone said to me years ago, um, everyone always said that I was stupid. This, this is what they were telling this individual. Everyone always said that, that she was stupid and, and, and she could never do anything and she may as well be quiet. She couldn't do this. She couldn't do that. And I think that broke that person's spirit so that they felt everybody around them did not care. And they felt like God could never use them because of what that individual said. And it's a blessing to see that individual. Yes, they're still a little bit timid, but it's a blessing to see them coming out from what was pushed down on them. You know, so I say to you guys before we go into announcements, if you're finding yourself, because our topic is the church doesn't seem to care, understand that there are up some people in the church that will care about you, that they do care about your well-being, they do care about what you're going through, they do care about the fact that they want to see you grow and they want to see you flourish and be the man or woman of God that he's called you to be. So don't allow church hurt from this particular aspect or any of the cliches that we talked about today to cause you to want to go back or step back or leave God's house of worship. Don't do that. Amen. Now, next week, guys, we're going to pick up. I can't wait to get to some of these cliches. If y'all have the book, go on and read page 189 on until the end of this chapter. It is interesting to me, some of these cliches of what people use against God's people to make them think no one in the church cares. Amen. But we thank God for you being with us on today for another segment of Fresh Oil Live Talk. Pastor Vicki is going to give us the, um, she's going to give us the announcements and we're going to move on.